So welcome everyone to today's ECHO, how can healthcare workers recognize the risk of germ spread and know what actions to take to stop it? We can go on to the next slide. So welcome again, we're really pleased that you all could join us today for our fifth Project First Line ECHO session. If you have any IT difficulty during today's call, please chat directly to our chat monitor, Dion in the direct chat and she will assist you. And if you want to enter your name, organization, tribal affiliation, and title into the chat box, please do. Next slide. So I'm Sophie Chishti. I'm a public health associate with Makui, and I'll be your host today. And joining me today, we also have Zoe Harris, who's a Project First Line Fellow, and Alyssa Longhi, who's also a public health associate at Makui. And so we will be doing our icebreaker today, and Alyssa will be our case facilitator. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today's session, we'll start with welcome and housekeeping. We'll move into our introduction and icebreaker, then have our case discussion facilitation. We'll also have a lecture done by Shay Drummond from the CDC. And we'll also have a Q&A exercise using Kahoot and then close out for the day. Next slide, please. So just a bit of housekeeping here, please feel free to turn on your videos, mute your microphones when you're not speaking, type any questions you have into the chat box, and please note that this session will be recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. Next slide, please. So Project ECHO collects registration, participation, questions and answers, chat comments, and poll responses for some tele-ECHO programs. Your individual data will be kept confidential. These data may be used for reports, maps, communications, surveys, quality assurance, evaluation, research, and to inform new initiatives. The ECHO session will be audio and video recorded. Your participation confirms your consent to this recording. Recordings will be used for program quality improvement and potentially future training opportunities. If you are participating via audio or phone only, please announce your name and location and put that information in the chat box. Next slide, please. And please note that only the introduction and lecture portions of today's presentation will be recorded for educational and quality improvement purposes. No protected health information or PHI is to be disclosed. All patient information related to the case discussion will be de-identified for presentation during this ECHO session and only case ID numbers and ECHO IDs will be used. Please do not share any protected health information during the ECHO session. Next slide, please. So the National Council of Urban Indian Health, or NACUI, is a national nonprofit organization devoted to the support and development of quality, accessible, and culturally competent health and public health services for American Indians and Alaska Natives living in urban areas. NACUI strives to create a broad awareness of Indian health issues while maintaining a visible presence in DC. We hold conferences, webinars, and host an interactive website that helps to disseminate information and facilitate partnerships. Next slide, please. We would also like to thank the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, for their continued support. Project First Line is a national collaborative led by the CDC to provide infection control training and education to frontline healthcare workers and public health personnel. Nikui is proud to partner with Project First Line. The contents of this program do not necessarily represent the policies of the Triple AHC accreditation body, OSHA, CDC, or HHS, and should not be considered an endorsement by the federal government. Next slide, please. And just a quick reminder to complete a survey on today's sessions so that we can continue to improve our presentations. Here's a QR code that will lead you to the survey. Feel free to scan this with your phones and complete this as we go throughout the session. Each slide will carry this QR code at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen for easy access, and we will also put the link in the chat. Next slide, please. And here you'll see a brief example of what our survey looks like. It's very easy and quick to fill out, so we appreciate any feedback uh, that you all can provide. Next slide, please. And so now I will hand it over to Zoe Harris to do our icebreaker. Thanks, Sophie. So just to get everyone's brains moving as we get started for the day, um, we're going to start with a quick icebreaker. And then as a reminder, if you just entered, just take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. Next slide, please. 
So we are going to be using Poll Everywhere for our icebreaker today. So you can all give your responses live and we'll be able to see them and note that you are able to do it anonymously. So if you're using a computer, you can open the link in the chat, um, which is pollev.com and you enter Wired Sun, all, uh, capitals 334, to respond to the activity. You can also use your cell phone and you can text Wired Sun 334, that same code, to 22333, and then text your message. As you can see, Dion has put that information in the chat. You can also send her a message if you're having any issues. So we'll give it just a second for everyone to um, either log in on their phone or on their computer. And you can go to the next slide, please. So um, just to have a little bit of fun as we're beginning, so we're going to start with what is your favorite Native-owned business. Um, if you don't have one, this will also be a great opportunity to learn about some new places that you can support. Eighth generation. Yes, love that one. Wandering Bull, my aunt's beating work. Very good one. If she has an Instagram or a Facebook, feel free to put that in there as well. Lakota Arts and Crafts Facebook. I didn't know that they had that. Thanks, Marie. Beyond Buckskin, that's also a good one. Beyond Buckskin has a lot of cool stuff. Um, ooh, Thunder Hats. I haven't heard that one either. Eagle Feather. I know that Beyond Buckskin also has like an entire list of um, native owned businesses. Um, yes, Marie, family owned ones. So another good one um, for my own tribal community is the Wampanoag Trading Post. They have a physical location in Ashby, but they also have an online store. So they have local artists, but they also have like Passamaquoddy Maple there, which is another great business. Um, they support people from the Ho-Chunk Nation. Um, so I highly recommend them as well. All right. So it seems like we have a couple in there and we will go on to the next question. So thanks for everyone for participating. Next slide, please. This next one is a little bit more related to the topic today. So we want you to rate on a scale of one to five, how prepared you feel in recognizing germ spread within your organization. Remember responses are anonymous, but we have not prepared all the way up to prepared. So not prepared is one, somewhat prepared is two, neutral three, prepared four, as you can see on the screen. Um, if you're submitting it through text message, then you can do A, B, C, or D, or E, excuse me. All right, so we, we have some people that are somewhat prepared. Sorry, go ahead, Diane. Some folks are responding in the chat. Mm -hmm. We have a few people that are saying neutral, kind of prepared, somewhat prepared. At least nobody feels that they aren't prepared at all, but hopefully after this, we all have some more information to help better prepare you. All right. Great, and I will uh, send it back to you, Sophie. Thanks everyone for participating. Thanks, Zoe, and thanks everyone. You can go to the next slide. So we wanted to briefly cover the anatomy of an echo as it has changed slightly from the traditional model. So today the case presentation and discussion will be coming before the lecture Q&A. Next slide, please. So our objectives for today uh, first, we'll explain the germ reservoirs of the human body and the healthcare environment and why they are important for recognizing risks for germs to spread. Next, we'll identify tasks in healthcare that can cause germs to spread between and among reservoirs. And finally, we'll understand infection control actions that healthcare workers can take to stop germ spread through case discussion. Next slide, please. And now I'll pass it over to Alyssa to do our case facilitation for today. 
Thanks, Sophie. And thanks, Zoe, for those great questions. There's some birthdays coming up in my family, so now I have some shopping to do. So as Sophie mentioned, we're going to move on to our ECHO case facilitation. My name is Alyssa. I'm a public health associate at Nakui. I'm also a descendant of the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux tribes in Montana. And today I'm going to take us through two great cases. Next slide, please. So first off, with some disclosures, I have no relevant financial relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial products and or provider of commercial services discussed in this activity. I also do not intend to discuss an unapproved investigate use of a commercial product device in our presentation. Next slide, please. So we kindly remind everyone to not share any protected health information during today's session or any identifying information. Please unmute your microphones and share your videos for this segment of the presentation. The recording will also stop now. Insight on the Thanks, Mark. Next slide, please. So I'm really pleased to introduce Shay Drummond. Uh, she's worked on other events with us. Shay is Project First Line's infection control subject matter expert. Prior to joining Project First Line, Shay was an infection preventionist, quality management consultant for the VA healthcare system, and has frontline nursing experience in disease surveillance, outbreak response, and public health. So I will now hand it over to you, Shay. Thank you, Alyssa. Next slide. So welcome everyone. Thank you for the robust discussion through the case studies and sharing your time today. Next slide. I have no financial disclosures today, um, nor will I be taking any unapproved or investigative, um, talking about any unapproved or investigative devices today. Thank you. Next slide. So today's agenda, I'm actually going to continue the conversation from the case studies that Alyssa presented and take a deeper dive into how we can use um, varied approaches to our infection control training and using our core materials. And this will help us address the diversity in educational levels, languages, the professional roles and cultures that we see with our adult learners, and as we continue to look for creative ways to educate our healthcare workers on what actions they need to take to recognize risk and stop germ spread. Then for fun, we'll actually wrap up with a Kahoot quick quiz. Um, this is gonna allow us to demonstrate an interactive training tool and to assess your learning knowledge today. And it's also gonna give me an example to showcase for you some of our new Project First Line interactive materials that are now available online. Next slide. So in our previous ECHO sessions, we've covered the Project First Line paradigm of the four body and four environmental reservoirs. We've talked about where germs live and how easy it is to spread via pathways between and among these reservoirs and how to recognize where there's risk for them to spread and why it's so important to take those infection control actions to stop them from spreading and making people sick. Next slide. So I included the next two slides more for visual reminders and refreshers from our previous ECHO where we talked about the four body and the four environments. And I really wanna use these to tie into today's case studies to emphasize that it is infective, effective infection control education that ultimately drives successful infection control actions. Next slide. So just as we have studied through Project First Line that there's five key elements of how germs spread in order to cause infection, there are also key elements of effective infection control training. We need to first recognize that we can't rely on a one-size-fits-all approach to training and education. And I think everyone on the call this morning gave great examples of, of how you are individually meeting those unique needs and your approaches. Ideally, you would start with a training needs assessment, which I touched on briefly, um, and that would really be the driver on how you're going to approach that education. You would have learning objectives. You'd want to make sure your content is accurate and relevant, and you would seek out those opportunities for learner engagement like we are doing today together on our ECHO. And then, of course, training doesn't stop after completing the session, and to qualify to 
you know, be considered a quality training, you're going to, going to do that follow up after the training. And that would include the evaluation. So every echo comes with QR codes and links to do your um, assessment and a review. And then we don't want to forget about following up with those that we've trained and what are their ongoing needs and training as we go forward. Next slide. What actions can you take? So this is a, um, one of our new infographics and our materials and what actions you can take is also our overarching goal why we are here today. But I think we also need to ask ourselves the second part to the question is how can we train staff and effectively implement these actions? Next slide. So these are IPC actions that all of us are familiar with. Some of us have responsibilities of doing these in our day-to-day -day work settings. Some of us are responsible for training people on how to do these. Some of us are in administrative roles where we have to support these IPC actions in our institution and facility. And as we learned in case study two today, the results seem to be favorable to the use of these combined educational strategies for not only the actual education, but the non-education dissemination part. So I like to think of it as that layered approach to IPC. Um, this would include consideration of equity issues as well as acknowledging that the goal is not to reach all healthcare workers with the same training, but we really need to understand the differing needs of our broad healthcare workforce and meet them where they are. In other words, adapting our training and educational approach, not asking them to adapt their learning needs. Um, let's use hand hygiene as an example since we've talked about that a bit today, and I think it's such a simple thing, but it's one of the most challenging aspects, whether it's with staff or visitors within our healthcare setting. So as you all know, hand hygiene is required IP element by joint commission. So um, it's one I like to share some layered examples. And these tie in nicely with the two case studies. So some examples of a layered approach that a facility could use as part of their hand hygiene program would be um, potentially starting with a didactic lecture, which could be in person or online, as much of our training has been delivered through COVID. Then the content of the lecture could be tailored to the specific audience that you're delivering it to. If you have the ability to do in-person lectures, a good tie-in for hand hygiene is having someone on your staff do actual demonstrations of hand washing and using hand sanitizer and don't stop at just doing the demonstration, but engage with the healthcare workers and have them do the demonstrate back where they're showing you that they actually do have that competency. They've demonstrated the proficiency and can get coaching and feedback if necessary. Then with hand hygiene, one of the things that you're going to want to include is those follow-up audits and observations in the work setting. And this is a great way to acknowledge and thank your staff for doing a good job. So you randomly walk up, you see someone that's performed hand hygiene, tell them thank you, give them, give them a pat on the back. If you see someone that missed an opportunity for that hand hygiene, this is your moment to step in and just do that gentle reminder, do a little just-in-time coaching and get them back on track. One of the fun projects we did in my former BA facility for hand hygiene, and this ties in nicely to a couple of the talking points in the lecture today, is we engaged our members of the executive C-suite, and they were thrilled to do this. We took pictures of them performing hand hygiene at the sink, doing hand sanitizer, and we took these pictures throughout the hospital. We then blew them up into full-size posters so we had Mr. Keith Rupko, the head of the organization, doing hand hygiene, life size, standing on a poster board in our lobby of our hospital. Not only did this let the staff know that, hey, management cares about this and 
is engaged and they're doing this. It also worked really well for guests and people coming into the facility and helping share that spread IPC education process. Next slide. Standard precautions. I know you're all very familiar with standard precautions. We touched on that a bit today. And as our second case study discussed today, that improving our healthcare workers' adherence to IPC guidelines increases their protection and everyone else that comes into the institutions. But the article did also point out it's very imperative that the healthcare workers be trained on standard precautions, principles, and practice needs. Next slide. With COVID, we're all very much familiar with the second tier of infection control, transmission-based precautions, and the need for ongoing training. As part of the training, you want to make sure healthcare workers know where to both access standard and transmission-based guidelines, as well as any facility-specific guidelines that relate to both. One of these studies referenced in um, one of the research that they did, which was done with nurses, doctors, allied health, that these workers had actually had what they called suboptimal training on PPE, personal protective equipment. And none of them had to do any of this um, demonstrate back on how to doff and don. Um, it was just a very flat training for lack of a better word. So when they interviewed these individuals for the study, 18% of the participants incorrectly agreed with the statement that there's no need for hand hygiene if gloves are used, which to me is suggesting that many healthcare workers are unaware of the risk for contamination during PPE removal. The study results also supported the value in requiring healthcare workers to demonstrate proficiency, as well as um, the need for post-training and ongoing training and assessments. Next slide. So this tier of CDC recommended practices, as you know, are basic IP practices that we're all required to follow. Um, so let's jump down and look at um, properly handle and properly clean and disinfect patient care equipment, instruments, devices, and environments. With all the new and emerging viruses we're seeing, such as monkeypox, these require ongoing and consistent training for our staff. So a topic example would be, um, how does a healthcare worker know what disinfectant products to use? And this is something we're getting a lot of questions on. So the answer as part of the increased monkeypox cases, the EPA in May triggered its emerging viral pathogen, which is shortened to EVP guidance. And what this means is they've already studied rare and novel viruses in the event of outbreaks and what this means is though there might not be disinfectants that specifically say for monkeypox on them, the EPA has already tested and registered products for use against specific pathogens that are of high consequence. And what they've done is they've demonstrated the efficacy of these products against very difficult to inactivate viruses. These are viruses that are much more difficult to kill than monkeypox. So these are the kinds of questions your staff are gonna have, and they're gonna to wanna to know where to go to get answers. So where do you go for this information? This example, you would go to EPA list Q, and that will provide you of the details of all the disinfectants that are necessary. Training our workforce on the how to use and find these resources is something um, that is a very essential part of the IPC toolkit. Next slide. I'm excited about this product. This is one of our new interactive resources on our project first line page. It's three different scenarios that um, anyone can go to and it's really what's wrong with this picture. And then when you click on, you will get all of the answers of the whys behind what not to do. Next slide. This is another one of our interactives, and this one is um, tying together those pathways and reservoirs that we've studied through our various echoes and understanding where germs live and how they spread. So that's a, another fun one to check out. So, 
Okay, enough for the lecture. Are you guys ready for the challenge? We're going to do our Kahoot quiz. All right, so Kahoot is a software that I just learned about for this uh, Echo session. So you either can use, um, go to the Kahoot link and you can use your computer or cell phone and you can type in the game pin or share the QR code on the screen. Go ahead and put a name in. You can be anonymous. You can come up with a nickname and uh, we'll get started. Next slide. And we're waiting for all of our players to get loaded. And as Alyssa mentioned, so much of um, the ECHO process incorporates all these layered educational opportunities and different ways to meet different styles of learning. And Alexander, whenever we're ready to roll, The scene that I am going to use is from two of our interactive products that we now have up online, which make a good jumping off point for more detailed training. But again, it's a product that anyone can go in and do on their own time, or it could be pulled into a more formal structured um, teaching session. And I just wanted to add for anyone who's hesitating to play, this is a very like light, fun game. So you can just use the secret name no and <laughs> play in the background. Yeah, no pressure. And it's really, a, a, for me, it was a neat opportunity to see how a different software platform works that you can uh, utilize in your area. So the scenario that we're going to do today, we're going to start with one and it's called the diarrhea dilemma. And the scenario is that it's a healthcare setting. It's during COVID. So staff members will be wearing the required masks and PPE for uh, working in a COVID setting, not necessarily COVID ward, but just general care setting. So healthcare workers would be wearing that facility provided mask. Here we go. So if you go to our PFL website, this is what you would see for the diarrhea dilemma. So um, here's the scene, you're working in this healthcare system and you go to change the patient's bed linens. When you pull back the sheets, you notice that there's diarrhea on the sheets and some may have gotten on your hands. What is the first thing you should do? So, A, clean mattress, B, put on gloves, C, remove dirty linens, or D, wash hands. Very good. The answer is D, wash your hands. And the Y is when you pull back the sheets, you may have touched something that was contaminated with stool. So there's so much bacteria and germs in stool. It can be a minuscule amount. So you need to clean your hands before you touch anything else. And when you think you have stool on your hands, the second part of this is you should use soap and water to clean your hands because we don't know if that stool is contaminated. Um, think about our C. diff lectures that we've done. So go straight for that soap and water. Um, next question. All right, ole. Now that your hands are clean, what's next? A, put on gloves. B, remove dirty linens and bags. 
C, use hand sanitizer, or D, put on a gown. All right. So the correct answer is put on a gown. And this was kind of a trip question. I threw this in um, intentionally just to see if people were listening. But because you're in a healthcare setting where you're already masked because of COVID, and there's no reason to change that mask out for this particular scenario, the second step in the PPE would put, be putting on that gown. If you did not have a mask on, and I want to share this because donning of PPE is so important, the second step would have been masking. But um, so this was a little tricky, but um, it looks like we have a winner on this one. So we'll move on to the next question. So now that you have your gown on, what's next? Put on a mask use hand sanitizer, clean the mattress, or put on gloves. All right, very good. Put on gloves is the correct answer. Back to our standard precautions. You know that if diarrhea is from an infection, it can be spread by touch. That's why we want to use PPE. We want to keep that off of our, our clothes. We want to keep it off of our hands, off of our body. And so putting on the gown is the next step. And then after that, you always want to put the gloves on last. All right, next question. The next scenario that we're moving to is um, Fidgety Felix gets an IV. A child, Felix, has just been admitted to the hospital and you're about to insert an IV into his arm. The first thing that you will do is put on gloves, true or false. Wonderful. Answer B, false. You should wash your hands first with soap and water or use hand sanitizer. So back to um, our case discussion and making sure that our staff understand that importance of hand hygiene every time before putting on gloves and hand hygiene after you take the gloves off. All right. Now that you've fin finished inserting that IV, we're going to talk about what is that next step. Remove gloves, wash hands with soap and water or use hand sanitizer, dispose of used supplies, or disinfect Felix's skin. All right, we have a variety of answers here. The correct answer is C, dispose of used supplies. So while you're um, in your PPE, you want to go ahead and get those sharps and anything that might be contaminated out of the way. And um, good job, everybody. So now let's see who our top winners are. And it looks like our winner, number one, is 3039, four out of five, and that's IPC Master, aptly named. That's very good. And if IPC Master wants to come off so we can give them a shout out, I think we should uh, all give IPC Master a round of applause for <laughs> acing the quiz. So that's awesome. And that ends the quiz, and we just have maybe no time for questions, maybe a minute or two. Hey, we can continue if you are, if folks have to hop off, we understand. Um, but we'll open up the floor for questions if anyone has any questions for Shay.
If there are no questions, then we can move on. Thank you. Next slide. And these are some of our resources and materials. And as Dion mentioned, um, we would um, be sending out additional references that we'll send out to the group. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time as always. And know that you can reach out to us if you have questions, if you need any clarification or want any assistance on the materials from Project First Line, don't hesitate. We're a resource here for you. Thank you, Shay. And as we wrap up today's session, we just want to remind folks to listen to our podcast if they haven't uh, heard of it. It's the Green Native Healthcast, hosted by Vicki Oldman. So please take a listen. The links for three of our episodes will be shared in the chat. And from this screen, you can scan the QR code to listen to it as well. Uh, next slide, please. And if you want to uh, know about more of our upcoming events from Nikui, you can visit our website at nikui.org slash events. And we'll also put this link in the chat as well. We hope to see you at future events. Next slide, please. So thank you all for sharing your time with us today. Again, please take our survey now that the session is over. It really helps to let us know how we can improve and we'll stay on in the, few, in the room for a few more minutes to give you time to respond to the survey. And if you would still like to add any questions to the chat or unmute yourselves and ask questions, please feel free to do so. But thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope you all have a wonderful day.